Present. All right, cool. All it right, says man. it's recording. What's up, Liam? Uh, not too much. It's about as high energy uh, a day as we can get here. Uh, it's like gusting at 20 miles an hour and 70 degrees, just gorgeous. <laughs> Wild. Are you guys uh, safe from the fires, I trust? I think so. It feels kind of smoky out right now, but I, the air quality is way better than it has been in the last week or so. I see some dragonflies and I'm actually hiking right now or walking away from the freeway so that we have some decent sound quality, I hope. Nice. What have you been up to lately? Um, working out and going swimming, you know, some classic stuff, listening to podcasts. Yeah. What are some good podcasts you got going lately? Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> I really like uh, the work that the Grimerica show does. I think those guys are doing some awesome stuff, just like championing what independent alternative media uh, can be and really ought to be, um, in my opinion. They always get awesome guests on and... And also, I just love their intros. I totally, I, I want to make every show I do have as uh, pleasant uh, an intro as, as they do. You just, uh, you just like want to be in a room hanging out with those guys, you know? <laughs> I, yeah, that sounds cool. Uh, yeah, I, w I wish we could do some kind of an intro, but I feel like this is as natural and not forced as as intros get like let's just let's just roll let's just start talking sure yeah yeah back to uh back to grimerica man it's tough actually i was trying to think of like a good guest they had just had on that you might know uh because they've had to like go kind of full uh full into the news rather than like health or consciousness like normally their guests are talking about like alternative health or consciousness studies or like ufos and all that kind of stuff but no we got to get them uh i gotta reach out to them and try and talk them into the whole uh sh sugar might be a optimal glucose might be the optimal fuel for this cell because they had a guest on who is trying to make points about red light and also you know sugar maybe being a, a, a good thing and yeah. They were all skeptical. Anyway, man, uh, yeah, so we were talking about the list um, of topics you might want to you might want to cover. My list is really short, so whenever the hell you want to hit me with these questions or topics. Well, I don't I don't really have any questions, but I do have some things on my mind. We uh, we we've been in the middle of a move, and we're we're kind of posting up for a bit, and we're lucky enough to be able to do that at my mother-in-law's house and she's she lives there by herself and she's real cool she's about as cool as a mom could get I feel like my mom's cool too but in a diff they're different very different and she's uh she's real cool she's real adaptable so she's got a lot we talk about energy uh she has a lot of signs of someone who has high youthfulness factor at an old at an as as she ages and so She's cool. She's just down and she can roll with things really well. And she's, she's, she's kind of invited us to be there. Um, so we're doing that and we're going to go shopping for an RV next week. So we're, uh, we're not sure what we're going to do, but we're doing this by choice. And we're just thrilled about this kind of, it, you know, going more minimal as far as all the stuff that we have acquired over the years and just more of an adventure life. Uh, so we just went through this move and that's one of the things that was on my mind was we spent a couple days moving. My wife is determined that if we move again, she's going to hire movers. And I have a different perspective on it um, because it's, and I call it Zenso, right? Or just any type of, you know, movement expression. But I was getting in some positions and lifting weights, uh, like, like boxes that weighed, 
more than I think I've ever lifted and like big stone uh, water features. And, you know, when you're moving and you, you can probably relate to this, you do some things that are just, just, just taxing. And, uh, and I really enjoy that because they're things that I don't usually get involved with. Like the, some of the, the boxes are so big and some of the pieces of furniture are so awkward that you just, you have to do some crazy things, uh, to be able to move the, these things around. So I, I kind of dig that. And, uh, you know, I think we were talking in the first episode we did about the idea that uh, it would be nice if we could live a life where we didn't have to like lift weights, where our life was active enough and we were doing the things in, in, inherently that, that are just like, like a strong lifestyle. Um, but we just don't, right? Like we live in a box and we don't get to do these things. So it's almost ironic, like because I lift weights and I like it, and because I've lifted a lot of heavy things in my life as kind of routine or, or routinely for play, when we do something like this, where we move a bunch of stuff, it's just, it's so much easier. And it's also kind of like, to me, fun, like I said. So we've been going through that. I am exhausted. Like, you know, I mean, I think you can relate to this too. When, and you said it the other day, when, when you move, like it's so stressful. Um, so I, I'm definitely in need of some, some good night's sleep and some kind of low key behavior coming up, I feel like. But that's, that's what I've been up to the last couple of days. Right on. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so easy to say, but moving is a great opportunity for moving. You know, you, you, you got to carry things and it's like, you know, I, I'm totally guilty of trying to put my workouts in a convenient uh, box where it's like when I'm feeling optimal, you know, I'm well fed and high energy and everything and calm and everything's good. And then, then you got to move sometimes and it just sucks because you'll be like, you know, trying to eat and move at the same time because it takes three hours to get from where you are to where you're going and it's always wildly inconvenient but yeah you're right it does force you uh force you to come up with some creative ways of moving your body to get the job done yeah i mean it totally does we have this water fountain i kind of alluded to it but we have this water fountain it's like all stone and it is definitely the heaviest thing i've ever had to move before and I've said this before because I've moved it like th on three separate occasions now and every time it's interesting I feel like I get a little bit more maybe smart about how I move it but and I didn't have any help this time sometimes I've had someone on the other end of it and I just have to get trick uh, crafty with how I do it and so there's like all these little games like we're putting a lot of stuff in storage too because we might go the RV route and so we're we're keeping like the the must keeps in like storage and uh, we packed our storage full and then I we have this long ass rug like a like a, a a really nice rug that we've had for a bunch of years we acquired it uh, at some point and it's it was it's super long even when you roll it up and I was like and we had already packed everything in storage and the whole storage was like completely full like almost to the ceiling and so I get to storage it was like the last thing to put in the storage and I we had forgotten about it and I was by myself and then I had to return the U-Haul like in a half hour, like, you know, a couple miles away. And so I'm sitting there looking at this rug and I'm like, what, how am I going to get this thing in there? And I like stuffed it in like in the top left corner and then it got stuck and it was half out, half in. And I'm like, I got to go in there. And so like, there's barely any space in here. We packed this whole thing, you know, completely, you know, from the floor to the ceiling. And I'm like crawling like through little holes and like, up up into the thing and I got myself into the back left corner and I thought I was gonna get I thought I was stuck I thought I, I would not be able to get back out and I, I I like pulled on the on the rug and like got it in I tugged it in and like got it all the way in the storage and then I then I had to figure out how to get back out of the storage and um just stuff like that like to me it's really fun obviously it requires a great deal of energy and I'm like I'm I'm feeling it now um but yeah, like stuff like that's kind of cool. Totally. So the other thing I realized this morning, and this, I don't know if this fits into a, a conversation like this, but maybe, and I, so I was, I, I had one more load at the house and so I, the old house. And so I went back to the old house and the forerunner and, and 
our boy came with me uh, and he's three and a half and just amazing. Like I'm, I'm learning so much from him every single day. And just the, uh, so we spent on the way home after we loaded the car back up and came back to SAC, we probably spent about an hour and a half and our conversation revolved around two things. We had like an hour and a 90 minute conversation and it was about, he, he brought up uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were at Quick Quack Car Wash and, and we had the, we were vacuuming the car and the vacuum got stuck on my shirt and it was sucking up my shirt. And so we spent about 45 minutes talking about that and just the details and the depth, like it, and it's so exhausting, but it's so, it's such a good reminder to me. I feel like you don't need anything else, but it takes so much energy to like settle in on, hey, this is what we're talking, we're talking about a vacuum eating my shirt for about 45 minutes. And then the conversation shifted to, he was telling me a story about his friend, Nice Tiger, and him zip lining. And he, he and Nice Tiger invented these suits, these new kinds of suits that hook to the, and he was calling it a telephone wire, but like the zip line wire and, and go across. And so he had seen pictures of my wife and, and, uh, and I zip lining from several years ago. And so he, he's been thinking about this zip line thing. And so he was telling me a story about Nice Tiger and him and these new zip line suits that he created. And, and that took about another 45 minutes. And uh, we spent an hour and a half talking about a vacuum and a car wash and, and, uh, and the zip line suits that he and Nice Tiger had, had developed. And it was so awesome. And then he turned into a beast after we got back to where we're going to be in East Sac. And he was hiding behind every corner and just yelling and screaming like a beast as I was unloading stuff from the car. And so it's a, it was amazing, but I'm, again, I'm, I'm spent. I hear you. So that's it. Like, that's, I, I just, I just shared with you my life for the last uh, couple of days. <laughs> right on. Um, and that would also definitely cover, uh, the question I might otherwise pose to you, which is what, 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 what have you been doing for your last couple workouts? That's it. Yep. Yep. Totally. And, and I usually, and you, you kind of touched on it, but like, I've been getting to the point where I, I try to engineer my activity levels based on how energized I feel. And if I feel like I haven't been sleeping, you know, I like to sleep eight or nine ideally hours a night. And if I'm not well rested and if I'm not putting a lot of good fuel or whatever I consider good fuel in my body, like I'm really going to, I'm, tr I'm going to try to match that with a low activity level. And sometimes you just don't have a choice. Like I haven't gotten a lot of sleep the last couple of days, but it's nice to know that if you have to dip into that, uh, I guess like real stressed state on purpose, cause you just, or, or you just got to do it that you, that we have that available, I guess. Yeah, totally. And, and hopefully you can do that, uh, voluntarily and without, without any added or like forced magnification from emotional or psychological stress as well, you know? And I think that's a big thing is like, when you know that you are burning, you're running on your reserves or you're like running unsustainably, um, if you can, if you can be aware of that consciously, it can really help to keep things in perspective so that the, uh, so that the stress doesn't, so that the stress uh, remains physiological and doesn't kind of snowball into like this um, negative state, this negative headspace that, you know, where you might say something that you don't really mean to somebody you care about, you know, and, 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 mess other things up in life when, when you can keep that in a box of like okay this is just stress that my body is undergoing and eventually like I'll the stress will be over and I can restore myself back to a state of high energy yeah totally like for example two days ago is like a, probably the biggest move day and we had spent the whole morning like moving furniture from the house up onto the truck and then it was going to be time to take the truck to where we're going to be 
and then also storage. So we had a couple more like unloading trips and my wife was like, okay, you know, we'll be, you know, uh, let's go back and unload it now. And she did quite a bit of work too, to her credit. Um, although I, you know, together we did a lot of the heavy lifting and we had help from her brother, which was amazing. Um, but I was, I was spent and I was feeling it and I was like, that sounds great, but I'm, I, I just want to try to be transparent. Like I, I'm, I'm going to take about a 15 minute break. I'm going to make a big mango smoothie and I'm going to eat some Parmigiano Reggiano and in about, and in about 30 minutes, I'll be, I'll be ready to go again. But yeah. I was trying to explain to her and I think she gets it too, that if I just kept going at some point, I wasn't going to be a very good person to be around. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I needed, I needed the break. Yeah, I think there's a big case uh, to be made for maturity there where when you realize that being, making irresponsible decisions with your energy uh, will leave you in just as bad a place as making irresponsible decisions with your money, you know? And, and, and so it's, I see, I have, I find qualms. I totally judge people on this one. It's my bad, but like, I'll see people that I care about, like, spend their time and their energy like frivolously and and then they wonder why they like feel lousy later on and and it's just so obvious it's like no you need you need to take or, or they'll expect i don't know i guess my problem is just that when people like don't take responsibility for how they're spending their energy and then they're like oh well I only said those things because I was so tired. Well, I, I kind of feel like it's your responsibility, like you said in that in that instance, like you took it upon yourself to like, you know, put pause on what, what was going on because you needed to not go into that space where you might be a lousy person to be around, you know? And I, I think that's uh, a, a real symptom of maturity. Well, that idea that we're responsible. Yeah. And I, 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 I've been I've been cogitating on the, I think it was Arthur Schopenhauer. He's got a line where he says basically like you can do as you will, but you can't will as you will. And so even if we don't, we're not even if we have no idea biologically speaking like why we have have desires at all or where they come from or what comes into our head. At some point though, it's it's nice to think that we can take responsibility, and and then go from there. And it kind of made me think of like, I have a buddy who's a philosopher. He's brilliant in my estimation. And he's a fun guy to talk to, but I don't get, he, he, he shovels food into his body and, you know, goes on drinking binges and he does some things like nutritionally. Uh, and he doesn't seem to connect that his thinking ability and his ability to, to, to be a strong thinker might have anything to do with like his his nutrition like it's it's and it's weird to me like I've always wondered I, I think for a long time this is why we're having this conversation this is why we get along we've probably thought about this for a long time but it's weird to me that people don't connect their environment and then like Ray Pete talks about our closest connection with the environment is the food we eat and how how intimately connected we are to that yeah a hundred percent and it's tough when people are uh willfully ignorant of their their digestive tracts influence on their uh emotions and their thinking i think for most people it's their emotions and they don't even realize it they don't even realize they're irritable because they actually have a belly ache that they're just not paying and paying attention to um you know and it's especially if you start listening to everybody um like Ray and Danny and Georgie, you realize that like, wow, there is subclinical uh, hypothyroidism everywhere. And for a lot of people that manifests as this uh, low stomach acidity and low energy production in the intestinal tract, which allows for the growth of bacteria that don't belong there, despite what the news will tell you. And then this leads to this like perpetual state of uh, chronic elevated serotonin endotoxin 
and oftentimes like adrenaline slash and or estrogen dominant existence and people are just so used to feeling that way that they're either running on estrogen or adrenaline like one's the up and one's the down that they don't even think about it you know and that and the, that their digestive tract is sort of uh, not been serving them for so long they forgot that there was something else that could could be happening there you know and I think that's what's what sometimes can be good about uh, exercise is that like when people get into it and like really into it they realize like hold on a second like I really need my digestive tract to be working well in order to fuel these activities you know and at least that seems to be like a step in the right direction of seeing the intestines and nutrition as a conduit for energy to support your activities in life. Um, but just like in terms of like achieving that, that, that idea of fuel, well, your brain is the most metabolically active tissue. And I think to be uh, self-aware, namely in like metacognition, to have awareness of your, of your brain state, uh, I think that's possibly as, as valid a tool to measure your, your metabolic rate as anything else, as, as the uh, pulse and temperature. You know, it's like your pulse and temperature will tell you a lot. But if you can pay attention to your, your thinking and your ability to focus, uh, word recall, um, the ability not to say um a whole bunch, I think all of those things point towards like having a high metabolism. And once you can put your fingers on that and be like, oh, wow, this is what clear thinking feels like. Uh, I'm able to, you know, make progress in, in, in how I'm looking at problems and dealing with things in the world. Then you realize, well, okay, what are the things that are going to bring me away from this? I, I think that's totally true. Uh, you, when you talk about like awareness, as I saw a big bird or something right, come out of the bushes here. Uh, when you talk about awareness requiring or metacognition requiring a high level of energy, I, I, I'm reminded of an old uh, section in a C.S. Lewis book. I got into some C.S. Lewis stuff when I was in college, and I think it was mere Christianity that I was I was I was dabbling in, and the the his point was. Uh, was related to like being able to see the lightness or light and, or being able to see, uh, well, anyway, like the deeper you are in a hole, he was, he was trying, he was writing essentially like you're, all you see is darkness. So you're not, you, you, you don't know what the light looks like because you're, you're so deep in a hole. You just see dark, you just see dark around you. And so maybe, you know, when we're not aware, we're just so overtaken by, by so many other stimuli or in our, and maybe our alligator brain is so on that we just don't, well, I don't know. I kind of like what you said better. You just need, we, it requires energy. Metacognition requires energy. I think about the um thing a lot actually lately too, um, because, and I, I'm doing it, I do it. I have a buddy in Dripping Springs who's basically a professional speech guy. Like he goes and gives speeches and talks and he's trained himself at least when he's giving his speeches to not use, um, and, and he, we were talking about that, how he thinks that's the next level for me when I'm talking to learn how to not use the filler. And I've thought about it the last week or so a little bit. And I was thinking about Ray because when we listen to Ray talk, it, he uses it a lot actually. And so I almost have, and I do think it's powerful to not use it, but I was wondering, I was thinking like, well, how, how does it show up in, in, in Ray's interviews so much when he's speaking? And I almost came up with a different perspective of like, maybe because he's, we've, we, I think we've talked about this. He, he is so deliberate about the words he uses and I, and it seems to me that he's, he's really saying he's using the exact word he wants to use for a reason. And if, and, and if he doesn't have anything to say, he won't talk like he doesn't waste a whole lot of words. 
and so I'm wondering with him if sometimes his um is literally just him still working in his, in, on what word he really wants to use. So the um comes out while he's he's really uh, being discerning about what word will come next, and then so the um and then the word you know that he's chosen will will come after that. So I don't know. I was thinking about that. I wonder about that. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Ray is, Ray is interesting and definitely uh, impressive in his uh, succinctness. I think so too. I, what struck me a few times and I've, I've learned to, 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 to swim with it is when I've done a few, uh, I've shared some conversations with him and recorded them. And if I say something and it's happened a few times where I'll, I will say something that I think is powerful or I'll say a quote from someone or, or whatever. And just silence crickets, like nothing. And I'll wait a couple seconds because sometimes I'll wait a couple seconds and I think he's thinking of what he might want to say and he'll say it. And sometimes I'll wait a few seconds and he's not saying anything. Like he just doesn't have anything to say. He doesn't want to comment on like I brought up a Noam Chomsky quote uh, a few in, a few conversations back, and later after the conversation, I went back and, and did some searching on the internet, and I found some writings of Ray's where he talked about Noam Chomsky, and I don't think he likes that guy very much, or, or yeah, at least I, I don't to want to say that. I just think he has some critical uh, views on some things that Chomsky has said, and Ray mm -hmm. doesn't agree. Mm -hmm. And so I realized later, like, oh, man, I could have done some research on that one before I used the Noam Chomsky quote, because Ray was crickets. He didn't say he didn't say anything. He didn't have anything to say. Yeah. Yeah, you got to be careful with the quotes sometimes. So I am eager to bring this to uh, exercise and stuff here. Um, I'm going to pull up the email you sent me, because there were some things I wanted to speak to in those in that list or if something comes to your mind just go ahead and jump awesome. into it i'm going to try to set this phone up in the tree so i don't have to hold it how's that oh yeah because i it all started when i mentioned uh the bioenergetics uh videos on youtube um and i guess that Honestly, that kind of goes right into something that I wanted to make sure we did touch on today. Um, you were talking about the Nick Simpson, Danny Roddy interview, Rob Turner. Um, and soreness. Do you want to talk about soreness? Do you want to talk about cryos and ice baths? What do you want to talk about? I don't know enough about uh, cryos and ice baths other than what I've heard Georgie talk about and I think Nicholas Simpson and Danny talked about it a little bit I have I have like in my gut felt like it's just kind of a fad and it it might not be good um, but I, I know Georgie and and even Ray I think has talked about what might be going on biologically and it's it's or physiologically probably not good um, to do it too much if it feels good that's one thing but if you think you're actually aiding the recovery process or like doing something good metabolically it might not be what you think you might be getting sold on the you know the latest trend um, yeah so yeah that's all I, I, do you have anything to add to that on cryo I, I i'd like to look into it more i i haven't done a whole lot of research myself well actually yeah because like who was it? I think it was Kyle Mamunis. Yeah, it was. It was a Kyle Mamunis uh, interview with Danny. And he makes the point that you can increase the metabolism locally using topical T3, right? And I think that that would be uh, on one side of the spectrum to juxtaposed with cryotherapy and, and I need to draw a distinction here between cryotherapy and the ice baths like the Wim Hof stuff because they're different um you can 
effectively frees off fat. It's really interesting. And I don't know specifically what's going on uh, metabolically in those tissues when you're freezing fat, but it's a medical procedure that you can actually uh, elect. And it's sort of like a cosmetic thing, but, but it works, it works really well. And, and so Kyle was making the point that you could actually uh, achieve a very similar thing uh, with a localized effect by using uh, topical thyroid hormone, T3. So bo both of those sort of s sit on either side of the spectrum where you have one being uh, warm, right, the thyroid being, being warm and speeding things up and creating more meta metabolically active tissue. And on the other hand, you have the cold, which is slowing things down so much that they're basically killing the fat cells, right? Now, if you put that at the organism level, you have something like an infrared sauna, which would be akin to taking a bunch of thyroid, right? Um, warm and dry in particular. Uh, and then you have uh, an ice bath or like going swimming in cold water, right? And obviously like humans are capable of meeting uh, cold as a stressor. Very similarly, we're capable of running really fast and, and sprinting. And I think that those two states uh, are, are remarkably similar in that they are a uh, high energy response to an acute stressor, right? So if you're putting yourself in an ice bath, you're going for a swim in the ocean and it's like winter time, or even if it's just like 50 degrees because you live in Maine, uh, you might be promoting a this uh, people talk about cold baths as a mitochondrial uncoupler and I don't really know if that's possible uh, or if it's possible through simply that stimulus um, but hands down like the studies are there doing cold showers and going swimming in cold water will increase your metabolic rate short term. Okay. But if you're not backing that up with nutrition and a high resting metabolic rate, it's essentially just this very sharp stressor that's going to convince your body that it's winter time and that you need to keep things slowed down in order to conserve because you're in a low energy environment. Because most of the time that you would be swimming in cold water, you're in a low energy environment like winter time, right? And it would be, uh, a wise adaptation to slow things down and to slow the metabolic rate. So cold therapy can be really useful in terms of increasing the metabolic rate, but you're really like, uh, it, it, you're playing with fire, but not, you're playing with ice because it, it just as well, just as likely might actually slow your metabolism down. And, and alternatively, you could just like, cook yourself with a bunch of heat lamps and, and the infrared panels or put, build yourself a sweat lodge. Like there's so many other ways that you could uh, improve uh, circulation and increase the metabolic rate. Also all the, all the proponents of the ice baths are like, yo, it's really great for your growth hormone. But then you talk to Ray and you're like, well, wait a second, is growth hormone actually beneficial or is it potentially cancerous in this sort of, and promoting of this disorderly state of growth like this uh, chaotic um, over proliferation uh, state. I've done like years and years and years of cold therapy. Uh, I think I was like 15 when I started doing it and when I was like 15 uh, it was awesome. I would come out of the ocean and I would be uh, I would feel amazing of course high super high on adrenaline but I would be glowing. I would be so red like my, my, my skin was just so alive and it was clearly a really beneficial thing at those points in time. Um, since then, uh, I've definitely seen it have exactly the opposite effect uh, where it like slows things down and just causes this stress cascade and doesn't really help. So you're saying if you're a efficient uh, oxidative metabolism already 
you're a high energy person, you're well nourished, you're getting a lot of sleep, all these things are going into the pool uh, to help that pool of energy be replete. That it could have a positive short term effect as long as afterward you're continuing with those very highly bioenergetic or high metabolic behaviors. But yeah, totally. It's, it seems like currently so many people who are getting into these uh, cold water therapy situations or solutions are uh, intense endurance athletes who are maybe low carbing it. Right. And now we get in the zone where you really are playing with, like you said, cold, but you're playing with a, a bunch of stuff that's, that, that really probably will just make you a low thyroid low energy person uh over time right i i think it's really crazy when you realize that these people are seeing it as like their uh active recovery as their as their rest day you know and it's like hold on a second like you're not healthy enough to be doing your sport itself you're certainly not healthy enough to be exercising and now you're going to add this other stressor and that's really the point it's like you know, to compare it to sprinting, which is, I, I think, apt because it's a uh, high energy response to an acute stressor. Um, most people aren't healthy enough to sprint. I, like, I, I straight up wouldn't have most people sprint. Um, I would have probably more people sprint than I would have them go in a cold bath, but maybe, I don't even know. The point really is just that there's absolutely no good reason to just add these like really, really intense stressors like sprinting or yeah. cold, cold baths to people who are already running a deficit. And running and a deficit us... is everybody. Yeah. And don't get us wrong, I want to say maybe, if whoever's listening, like, it can be, if from my own experience, exhilarating. But I think what's so, but, but it's, it's definitely stressful. And so I think what might be exhilarating about it is the stress hormones that might be turned on in response to such a stressful activity. And those stress hormones are like making us feel like we have a lot of energy in that, in that window. Like, like, for example, I was a uh, sea ranch is like this this coastal resort place up nor Northern California. And I was visiting with my wife and we were, my mom had gotten a house that week and we went up there and we were hanging out and I went off one morning, it was raining. And I went off one morning, I said, I'll be back later. I'm going on an adventure. And I went running along the bluff tops and then down onto this, it's called Black Point Beach. And it was pouring rain already, it was cold. And I took all my clothes off because nobody was out. I went just everything off. And I was jumping over logs on the beach and stuff. And it was super fun. And then there was a, like a, like a creek or some kind of river or some like a stream at the top of the of bluff top that was crammed down a huge waterfall, like coming down the side of the, of the, of the cliff. And I was like, I got to go in there. And I went, it was one of the coldest things I've ever done. It was so, it was already pouring rain and the, the waves were crashing, you know, behind me. It was, it was one of the, it was, I'll, I'll never forget it, of course. But, and it felt amazing, but it was so fucking cold. And I'm sure it was super stressful, but it was exhilarating. But I, I'm not gonna do that every day, and I'm certainly not gonna do that. Well, at that time, I, I don't think I was really well well nourished, but. Um, yeah. I mean, it can feel good, right? Sure. So, yeah, I, I think that's the majority of the sentiments I have on, on cold at this point. Uh, what do you want to, what do you want to touch on from, from a list that you do or don't have in front of you? Well, you mentioned soreness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm just, I'm just curious about this. I want to see what you think. Like what, what research I have gone into, it, it seems to me that soreness might be a part of like the muscle building process or like strength development, but it certainly doesn't have to be. So in other words, like you don't have to feel sore for three days or not be able to walk to, to have like strength develop, development occurring. And, and the research seems to support this. So I think there seems to be this notion that you need to feel sore 
at the end of a workout. And it might be the same mythology that says you need to feel exhausted at the end of a workout to feel like something might happen as far as adaptation. Mm -hmm. and do you have any thoughts on that? Because I, I, as yeah. I, yeah, go ahead. I, I do. I think that uh, the fact that there is mixed evidence on it points to the fact that it's a uh, up to the individual. And honestly, I've thought about writing an article on this just because I get tired of hearing people say that, oh, well, it might happen in one person, but not in another. Or this one food might be good for this one person, but not for another. And this idea that like, because of our genes, we have some like really unique experience where one thing will work and another thing won't work. Rather, I see it all as a matter of the energetic states moment by moment that that person and those cells in that person are going through, right? So I, I don't know whether something, a factor like uh, the level of free fatty acids to glucose metabolism uh, that a person is, that, that a cell, a muscle cell, is experiencing before it performs uh, concentric exercise would if how that might affect uh, muscle soreness or not versus uh, eccentric exercise everyone likes to try and conflate the uh, eccentric ex exercise with uh, the production of lactic acid and the production of lactic acid being this like causative factor in uh, delayed onset muscle soreness I'm not sure that's really the fact, uh, the case. Uh, if you've ever done like some, have you ever done any like super slow eccentrics? Yeah, I've dabbled in a lot of, of that before, yeah. Yeah, those do tend to make me pretty sore. Um, yeah, no doubt. But I, I, I think that the, the bigger factor is uh, the range of motion. Um, there's, there's an intensity factor in soreness, like you do need to be doing like genuinely exhausting a muscle in order to be uh, achieving that exhausted state of soreness, I guess. Um, but the other thing is, is this stretch factor that's largely mediated by the fascia itself. And I guess it's the, the evidence there points more towards the fascia being the uh, not the driver of the soreness, but the communicator of the soreness, right? So you're not, when you think that your muscle is sore because you have that, that soreness feeling and you're stretching your muscle the day after working out, it's actually the fascia which is communicating that message to you. And I think, I think there's something to be said for well, if you have, if say, you, say you do a, a set of bicep curls to failure, and then you do another set, and then you do some forced negatives, right? So you're really like digging those cells into, into a hole. You're, you're killing mitochondria inside muscle cells in your biceps. You're killing whole muscle cells in your biceps, right? You're causing damage. And this damage hopefully will promote an overcompensation response to, to get your muscles stronger. Now, if the day after you're not, or, or, or after the workout rather, if you're not getting enough nutrients in, right, if, if the energy is insufficient and, and you're not able to fully heal, it would make sense that the next day when you go to like grab the bar to do a chin up or something, you're going to feel this, you, you, you'd think that your body would have uh, inherent protective mechanisms that would communicate to you, don't do that with that muscle in that range of motion because there is still damage here. So I think that's largely what soreness uh, can, can communicate is sort of like uh, an unfinished repair job, if that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense. I think, I think that might be true. I don't know for sure, like I said, and it warrants more research on my end, but there's a really cool TED talk by a guy named Lorimer Mosley. And I think he's like a rock star in the pain research world, uh, as far as I understand it. And, it, and the, the TED talk 
by Lorimer Mosley is called Why Things Hurt. And he does a really good job about talking about the brain or the nervous system. And you talk about fascia communicating. And I, I imagine that these are, these are interconnected and, and we might be talking about the same thing, but that the brain's ultimate role for us evolutionarily speaking is to protect us. And so when we've done something that either tears apart a lot of muscle or it, um, or we haven't done it in a while and the brain's like, well, what are you doing? That's, that's not your usual thing. Why are you doing that? And so we get this signal that's, that's spit out in through our nervous system, through our fascia maybe, that's saying, hey, you're sore. And it's the signal, of, and so Laura Mermosley, I think, does a good job of talking about soreness and pain. And these are in the, in the same category. Todd Hargrove talks about it a lot too. And I think we're speaking the same language when we talk about it like this, that that, that is a signal that to protect us. Um, I have a, I have an interesting story and I, I, I'm curious to hear what you think, but I've, I've ripped totally ruptured three of my four major tendons. So I've, I, I've ruptured, fully ruptured my, uh, my right Achilles tendon um, and both um, distal uh, bicep tendon, fully ruptured. And um, when I, when I ripped them all, and this is for every experience, and they were all different, and they were kind of freak things. Like, it wasn't like, oh, I was just walking around and I, I ripped them. Like, so they, they each have their unique kind of story of either overexertion or not listening to my body when I was already, um, like, had, like, an injury maybe, and I overdid it or something. Or I got myself in a real weird position, and I got scared, and I tried to hold on on rings when I was upside down, and I couldn't because my bicep couldn't handle it, and it ripped. So, like, but with each of these ruptures of these major tendons, no pain after they were ruptured. And so I, I kind of have this theory, I don't know if it's true, but that, that if I had ripped part of, of the tendon, or if I had gotten close to ripping it, the brain might have spit out or my nervous system might have told me like, there's, there's pain or there's soreness for sure as a signal to me to say, don't do that again, watch out, be careful. But once the, the tendon had fully ruptured, there wasn't anything left to protect. So maybe the brain was like, well, it's, it's ruptured. And I, why would I need to say that there's pain there? It's already gone. Like you're, you don't have anything to protect at this point. So I don't know, I don't know if, if you uh, would like to comment on that, but I've, I've always kind of had that working theory that that it, that it might have something to do with the uh, protection in the brain and stuff? Uh, I do think a lot of your, uh, maybe. I, I think that in regards to the protection of the brain, I see more of your motor output as a matter of protecting the brain from sensory input, meaning your senses inform your brain of the environment that it's in, like where gravity is, uh, the, the, the weight of things on you, the direction that things are coming at you, and then it distributes uh, force out through your fascia uh, and then into the muscles, like where it needs to. Where it needs to. Uh, but what you, what you really uh, brought to mind is my dad always driving home the point, because we would often talk about soreness, that your muscles don't have any nerves actually. And so that inside the muscle cell, if you, if you were to slice, if you, if you were able to uh, slice like into your bicep, you wouldn't, you wouldn't feel it, right? There would, you, you would, because there would be uh, other things that you would bump into in slicing into your arm that, that would trigger a, a painful response, but the, the muscle cell itself doesn't really have any of those, uh, pain receptors and I have to wonder well since uh like a uh a ligament is much less metabolically active there's so much less going on in uh the connective tissue than there is in muscle why, why would there be any of those really uh expensive s sensory receptors right so I I think I think that's more of what was going on and, and why there wasn't pain is that it was a clean tear, so to speak, 
and it was a clean tear right through tissues that didn't have any of the ability to communicate uh, pain to your body. Uh, thankfully for you, it would seem, because that does sound awful. So let me ask you this. These, these yeah. injuries happened, the, 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 the latest one, or the last one, hopefully the last one, the last major tendon I tear, happened 10 years ago, and the others were before that. So th and, and these were also at a time where I was experimenting with a lot of very stressful nutritional habits. And I can't say my metabolism was, was probably functioning at a very high level. And I've done some crazy physical endeavors since the last time this happened. And, and I've, I've never, I don't think I've ever really come close to, to these kind of issues, you know, since. And I do feel like, you know, my metabolism is working on a whole different level as I learn more about what that might mean to be like, in, like the word we're using is bioenergetic. So let me ask you this. Do you think that there could have been some issues with, a low functioning metabolism that made me more prone? I mean, the, the answer yes. probably clearly, right? Yeah, but. yes, yes. And I, and I think I can maybe speak uh, more specifically to the mechanism. Um, the organism feels, radiates out the experience, the aggregate experience of the individual cell, right? So if you're in a state, if you're, if a majority of your cells aggregate to uh, stress, or let's say in the case of an injury like that, uh, estrogen dominance, right? Um, you're going to be in this uh, destructured and poorly organized uh, state and be, being in that state you can easily identify actually uh, a person's hormonal profile simply through some muscle testing and I'm not talking about like the muscle testing where you hold something in your hand I'm talking about the actual tone of your muscle muscles both in a resting and a contracted state. So everything, I think it's really all, all sort of falls into this idea of the human being a, uh, a, a living crystalline structure that's always vibrating in, in different uh, states, right? And so if you are, yeah, if you're essentially weak, and, and and undernourished and, and your engines aren't really turning then all of the structure from the density of your bones and uh your your connective tissue will be compromised um are, are, are you aware of the the piezoelectric or piezoelectric nature of our bones no yeah well basically it's just this that because our bones are floating in our soft tissue, like we were talking about earlier, uh, off, off, the, off the call, if your, if your metabolism, if the, if the electrical energy that's going on in your soft tissue is uh, less, is A, less, less ordered, more disorderly, or, 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 or B, just insufficient, then your your bones essentially don't get the same uh, input to to generate uh, energy and electricity that then creates this feedback between the bones and the and the soft tissue, the hard stuff and the soft stuff. So there's like so I can't even uh, begin to I introduce the concept of the human as a crystalline structure right here without a considerable amount of research, but uh, and references. But it does really seem to be the the best explanatory model. Would this get us into like Gilbert Ling? Talk a yeah, bit? Gil Gilbert Ling for sure, and also uh, Gerald Pollack. Uh, have you read the Fourth Phase of Water? I I, I have it on my list now. I, I haven't read it yet. It it's nice and easy reading, honestly, and it's uh, got great illustrations. And hands down, I recommend it to anyone. Um, 
I think I think that probably segues into the point that I wanted to make sure that we didn't uh, we didn't uh, lose today, which is this idea of the active resting state that Ray talks about so much, right? And so he was referencing, he was citing somebody else when he, when he said this recently. He's like, there's three states. There's the uh, exhausted, nearly dead state. There's the, the high energy state, uh, sort, sort of like high energy and stress state. And then there's the active resting state. And he talks a lot about this active resting state. And in, in the last uh, stream he did with uh, Danny and Georgie, he was talking about the idea that every time you put energy through a system, it's sort of like there's this groove. And you were talking about this uh, in the last conversation we had. There, there's this groove that exists. And then the system creates a positive feedback loop to put more energy through that same groove, right? And so the the active uh, the active resting state in in my understanding at the cellular level is one which is characterized by the presence of carbon dioxide, right? Which signals to the cell that the mitochondria is healthy and producing energy and has already produced energy, right? So we've got the, the high carbon dioxide level, which means that the cell is maintaining the potential for further oxidative uh, respiration, right? But because it is characterized by the, 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 C, the presence of CO2, it's not presently, uh, in the case of a muscle, under load. It's not presently expressing energy. The groove is grease. It's right there and ready to, to, to lift the weight again. But it already has, and therefore, it reaches this state of, to again, uh, cite Ray, quiescence, which is the first time I'd heard the word quiescence yeah. as opposed to a acquiescence, but this the state of quiescence. Um, and it just makes so much sense to me especially when it, it really struck a uh, bell with me when I was thinking about it in light of the fourth phase of water, where uh, Pollock lays out this, this idea that the water inside your cell is not like the water in a glass. And it turns out that the ability of your body to keep the energy, the water inside your body in this highly structured way is a like all-encompassing measure of health and that really makes sense to me because the force the energy which structures water inside of a cell is the energy coming from the mitochondria right and so a, he a healthy uncoupled mitochondria will lose about 50 percent of its energy in the form of light and then this light is structuring the water inside the cell. So the idea is in, in, in terms of, of, of a bioenergetic view, like the healthy state for a cell, it would appear, would be this place where there's no water inside the cell that is not structured, and that the only thing giving structure to the water in the cell is the mitochondria. Therefore, this the cell uh, maintains this, as Pollock would put it, this n net negative charge. And this just gives you the potential to do work in the future, the potential for energy. And I think that uh, I'm, I'm, I'd really like to uh, listen to myself and make sure that I'm making all the best points on this because it's something I definitely see myself coming back to Achieving this state of quiescence, this state of uh, having made energy and capable of producing more, it seems to be at the heart of the value that basically all exercise has to offer. Because exercise puts us in a higher energy state, right? And if you talk to most people, they'll agree that there is oftentimes it's after the workout 
that they feel the best. It's after the set that they really feel the definition in their quads and they're able to find like one of the muscles in their leg versus another and they achieve this uh, further di differentiated state um, or the ability to relax. And I think that uh, as we're attempting to have this conversation, an ongoing conversation about the value of exercise or, or, or exercise, the place of exercise from a bioenergetic perspective, the high energy resting state of a cell and what that looks like and what that feels like, I think that's going to be uh, sort of like a heart, the heart of our conversation. What do you think? I, I love this. I love that we're having this conversation and I totally agree. Like that's why we wanted to do this essentially was to mm -hmm. get into some of the stuff that's out there and myth bust, right? Like, wh like what, what is just really destructive to health? And then what, what, is, what does it mean to be in this high resting energy state? And how can, how can uh, strength uh, play or whatever we want to call it, how can that play, play a role? Um, I love that word too, quiescent. And I've been thinking about that a lot and it reminds me too of like, like, um, like sleeping. And I don't know if this is the same conversation or not, but I just thought of this. Like it takes a lot of energy to sleep well through the night and to sleep soundly. And I, and I don't know if, the, again, I don't know if that's this. I'm, I'm, well, you know, making well a sleeping would be a great example because sleeping, there is, there's basically two forms of sleeping. There's sleeping warm in a, in a high energy state and then there's hibernating, right? Where your body is essentially conserving energy because it has no clue when the cold darkness will end, right? And so you, you don't want to sleep too much because sleeping for too long will tell your body that you're basically entering hibernation. And then you'll enter this estrogen reabsorption uh, period and it, it really causes a whole bunch of problems. Um, it's not to say that sleeping isn't a good idea, but you you know, there's um, diminishing returns that I think probably something like eight hours, you know? Well, I like that idea of diminishing returns because I think that comes right back to the, the whole idea of what's biologically energetic strength play look like. And for me right now, like, and I think this might be the next conversation maybe that we have, but like energy systems in terms of what energy is required for an action seems to be a part of this conversation, at least to me. And so I'm wondering, and I'm wondering this out loud and you can chime in and I want other people to, to chime in on this because I'm curious and I want to start diving into research on this. But like, for me, like if I'm in that, the, the phosphocreatine type of energy um, usage to, to power a movement, I, I feel like this is, and, and I can, Georgie talks about it. Like you can have a, a casual conversation when you're done with your set. Like, like if I, if I lift um, near max uh, deadlift for two reps and then I walk across the garage, I can still have a conversation with my wife mm -hmm. in, in, in most cases, or I can sprint up a hill for about five seconds and still be breathing <laughs> through my nose and slow down casually. And, mm -hmm. and, to me, I feel like this is a biologically energetic form of physical activity, um, even intense physical activity, because in, in, in the measure of the word intensity, these are both deadlifting a heavy weight and running up the hill, sprinting up the hill. These are both very intense actions. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I wonder, maybe that'll make its way into our next conversation, but I really want to dive into to that. And I'm curious myself and I want, I want to hear what you, you think and other people think too. For sure that it could be a ongoing uh, conversation. And the first thing that comes to mind is just the, the difference between the metabolism locally and systemically, right? Because you could totally fatigue and, and generate a whole bunch of lactic acid and, and, and re reach far beyond failure with forced reps on something like a wrist curl, right? Literally just a, just a wrist curl, only, uh, only trying to move the muscles 
below the elbow in order to stabilize and produce movement at the wrist joint, right? You could create this in incredible localized stress. And yet, systemically, I, I would be able to, to do that all while no nose breathing. And then right after finishing that, you know, go, go sprinting or, or, or carry on a conversation, right? And so, but for maybe somebody who's like even more severely compromised than myself, doing that would actually cause their whole system to enter uh, lactic acidosis. Or as Ray often says, a lot of people sitting at rest are entering lactic acidosis and are hyperventilating. So, so that's, that's a big part of it. And you're talking about like doing a sprint and like picking up a really heavy weight. And I just think those are great examples. Like that seems like a radical thing. Like who the hell does that and just goes about their day. But I mean, if you're, I, the closest thing would be to be like on vacation at some national park and you're, you're, you're soaking up the view and it's beautiful and you're taking a casual walk. And then you see that you could take a different path, but in order to take the other path and get to the, the beautiful vista, you got to do some like rock climbing. Well, you're already in this uh, active state where you're not like sitting on the couch, you're, you're up and about, you're just going to scramble up that, right? And so, and so life really should be full of more of those opportunities and, and, and something like pulling a deadlift that's really heavy just because it's sitting there in your garage, like it seems to me contrived, but of course that's really what exercise, exercise is. Well, I don't, I don't want to use the word primal too much because I think it gets used in other contexts that it's kind of like bastardized, but yeah. it seems like, like right, if there's, a, if, if there's a route you want to go when you're hiking and it requires a little bit more energy, to get to that point like or like there's a big box that needs to be lifted my wife says we need to put that in the rafters i gotta be able to hoist that over my head and get it in the rafters and, th and this is like real stuff um i i don't know i thought i thought of this too when when i do a short jaunt and i use the word jaunt as like a a, a, a dash up a hill you know that requires three seconds of high output do you ever notice when you do something like that or lift a heavy weight or move a heavy box or, or dart on a path somewhere that everything looks more vivid, like the colors of, of everything in the environment and like your experience seems richer on the other side of that. And I don't know, this could, this could have to do with like, you know, the stuff going on in the brain chemicals and stuff. And, but like, uh, I really like that in terms of like, uh, metacognition and stuff too. I, I, that, that seems pretty fun to me. I, I think there's a direct relationship that when you do exhibit and express higher energy uh, muscularly, it provides a basically instantaneous signal to the brain that the brain is existing within a higher energy system. And therefore it's like, whoa, you know, you just like skyrocketed your blood pressure and like, you know, everything just got turned on and lit up in a big way. And then your brain is like, oh, okay, well, what, what can I do with this? And then like you're saying, the, the, the color becomes more vivid. Like, yeah, even perception itself is energetically demanding and exists on a spectrum. You know, it's like not everybody else is seen with the same uh, richness of experience as you are. And, and that gets into the idea of uh, the concept of qualia are you familiar with that word? Not much. Qualia? Yeah, it's actually a, a nootropic stack now. Somebody branded the word. Um, and I think it's supposedly a pretty good one. But yeah, qualia, this idea that uh, the, the texture, the, the nature of your subjective experience is unique. And, and qualia refers to that. So the, the qualia that you're experiencing over there uh, in whatever air pollution you're dealing with and that temperature and that humidity it's also you know there, there's the environment contributing to your qualia and also you know what's going on physiologically like your uh brain atp levels and etc and your hormones all, all of that contribute to your qualia but yeah so per perception itself is energetically demanding and uh can fluctuate for sure 
Well, I have to say, maybe maybe it's relevant. As we're talking, I don't know if you, you realize I was like looking away several times. Yeah. Like I'm near this t tall grass by this old, actually my wife and I came here once when we were on a little adventure, a little trip. And uh, it's kind of a unique spot. I don't think that many people know about it, but there's like, we call it shit creek back here. But there's like all this t tall grass and I heard something like it sounded like like weaving through the tall grass so like i was kind of keeping an eye it seemed just very clear and it seemed like it was getting louder so i was like kind of keeping an eye out over there for like a snake or something maybe and then there was like on this branch there was an ant for a time that was crawling around on this branch in front of me to the side of the of the phone and these things i don't know i was just like getting i, I was listening to what we were talking about and what you were saying but i was also kind of just just caught in amazement a few times by some of the some of the sounds and, and nature here uh so that's kind of a that's that's not you know you know kind of an aside but i don't know i mean i would say I, that I, I, go ahead no i i i had uh a cup of coffee about an hour before we started and also about i was telling you about a, an eighth of a teaspoon of theanine which seems seems to be there seems to be a significant amount of research which says that that can lower serotonin levels which i know has mm -hmm. a, an impact on perception or or the experience of perception and so that might be part of it also but i wanted to i wanted to say like there's there's a you know if you go too hard or too long actually more more about duration maybe but if you go too long in a bout of exertion now you're getting into like some of the stress hormones that could be resulting in some of these, like we might feel good afterward, but, but, but we could be more in the, in the stress uh, kind of zone. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that just speaks to what uh, stimulus exercise can offer. It's like, well, are you, are you trying to uh, cultivate a higher state of energy or are you trying to drain your reserves of energy? You know, and so uh, I would always make, I'm always making a case against uh, volume and poor intensity in terms of weightlifting, that fewer sets and more intense sets, you know, not necessarily a heavier weight, but uh, two failure or close to failure might be more valuable than three sets near failure. Well, I'm looking forward to continuing that conversation because that's a lot of my experimentation recently is revolving around what you spoke to. Like staying yep. away from the, the duration, like long duration sets and, uh, and, and a lot of rest period in between. And I guess that speaks to wanting, that, wanting a high resting state uh, or high resting potential before the next set. For me, I think of it like too, like, um, you know, what are we trying to train? And like if I, if I sprint a hill, a short hill that's of a, you know, maybe a, maybe 5% grade for five seconds. Now, if I wait one minute and try to do that again, my output is gonna be of significant less quality than the previous one. But if I do that 5% grade hill and, and, and dash for five seconds, and then I rest five minutes, now the subsequent set has a chance to be of a similar uh, quality as, as the set before. And I think that's, I think that's valuable. I think a lot of people lose sight of stuff like that. Like, what am I training? Am I training being slower and less energetic or less able or less uh, capable of, 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 you know, being, uh, of using myself in a certain way or am I, or am I training the ability to use myself in a very uh, animate uh, kind of way? Yeah. And I think that also gets into, uh, cause, cause somebody might respond and be like, oh, well, you need to train your endurance systems because you need to have, they, they confer all these benefits and lo low intensity, steady state cardio confers all these metabolic benefits and these quote unquote metabolic benefits are all tied to like the low resting heart rate. And that right there is, uh, one of the, one of the pillars of, um, or, or points of contention with people in who listen to Ray and uh, drink milk and orange juice 
and the people who don't, which is that a low resting heart, my heart rate might be indicative of uh, a decline in health and not improving health. Yeah, there's snakes in the grass, not here in Maine. No, I, I actually saw a form, a moving form this time. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I just, I took a step back because I thought there's something about to jump out of the bushes here. I want to be, speaking of energy potential, I want to, I want to have the potential to, to do something. Um, yeah. Can you speak just a, a little bit more to that? I think that's important. And, and I think I'm, I'm actually getting low on battery. I yeah, yeah, we an should. Interesting ex experiment, but can you speak just a little bit more on that low resting pulse? Uh, concept because I think a lot of people think that having a, a slow heart rate is is really ideal and there's people who will brag about it who will say oh my heart rate's in the 50s or like athletes their whole life will say oh I have a, a, a resting heart rate in the 40s and that um, even if, even if you dive into the research as far as I as far as I know that's that's correlative to uh, not good long-term health and and possibly uh, uh, heart uh cardiac issues right yeah and and of, of course you look to all the like marathoners and people who take that really seriously and to the extreme and they die of heart disease just the same as everyone else does so it doesn't really seem to have this uh super super duper protective effect uh also if you have a resting heart rate let's say of uh 60 and then you engage in endurance exercise for three months, and now you have a resting heart rate of 48. You brought it down 12 points. The question is, what signal did you deliver to your body in the process? Because the odds are you delivered the signal that the available resources are slim, right? because you probably, are, you probably are not eating more in order to compensate. The, the, the resources are slim and the energy demands are, are high. And so the only adaptation to that is to become more efficient, right? Running on less. And again, this is something that Ray speaks to, which is the idea that you actually want to be wildly inefficient in your energy production because having this surplus of energy production and therefore energy consumption, having this surplus is what allows you to uh, buffer the stresses of life. And so by putting yourself in this state of scarcity where you're increasing the demands and not uh, supporting it with uh, incoming energy, the adaptation is to slow down and it's really just putting the brakes on damage. You're, you, the adaptation is damage control rather than growing into a bigger structure because you are putting more energy through your system. And I think that really is just the heart of what I might want to uh, end today with, which is like, well, what is exercise capable of giving us? And I would say that exercise is capable as this bizarre human invention is, is capable of specifically giving us more muscle. And we wanna do this because muscle is the most like active tissue at rest. And so if you have more muscle on your body, you burn more calories at rest. And therefore you have more structure to put more energy through your system. And this seems to be protective to the health of your insides and your organs and your brain in so many different ways. So I feel like there is either exercise that is supplementary to a life that is not engaging, and that sort of exercise ought to be pleasurable. And then there is exercise to serve the purpose of increasing your mus musculature. And I think that should be administered judiciously. So there's a difference I see two um, differing viewpoints. There's the viewpoint that someone needs exercise to be healthy because that's what the messaging says so much. That we need you need to do this to be healthy. You need to do endurance exercise to be healthy. You need, and then there's this other viewpoint that says 
it should be pleasurable. We should be doing what we love. If, if it brings joy, then it's probably good um, in, in some ways or in many ways, um, unless we get past that point um, of diminishing returns or, or, or like we're just doing too much of it. Um, but but the, if we feel like something is adding to our ability to be creative, to be imaginative, to be adaptable when something hits us, I like Moshe Feldenkrais's uh, definition of health and it's the ability of a person to be able to withstand shock and then quickly get back to his or her usual way of, of, of being. Um, and and it, 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 it talks, it, it speaks to that adaptability. Um, and so are we, are we not like quick to jump on someone or irritable or, and if, if these things are happening, it's probably not something that's bioenergetic or, or healthy, right? Totally. Yeah, man. Uh, I think that, I think that basically covers it. We got to talk about walking. Cause I know you, I know you really want to talk about walking and I want to talk to you about thinking about walking, but I think that's going to be a conversation in itself. Uh, what was the, what was the tidbit I just heard about walking? I'm a, yeah, I'm a big fan of walking, hiking, moseying, uh, strolling, uh, I have a lot of different words for it, but it's a big part of my, and of course, mental and physical health are, are interrelated, but it's a big part of my life. And uh, yeah, I think that'll be, that'll be for a next conversation. There was someone who uh, did a lot of his, his thinking while walking. Wasn't uh, it uh, Socrates? Well, probably a lot of those One guys of the Greek did. guys. Yeah, probably a lot of, I mean, I mean, it, it probably fact, it probably worked its way into a lot of the, a lot of great thinkers lives. Um, I know Aristotle started a walking school, like I think he called a peripatetic, a para, some, something along those lines where it was like, the lectures were all done while walking around the, the, the ground uh, in, in Greece, um, or Athens, or, or wherever Aristotle was doing his stuff. But, uh, but walking's big. I mean, and I think, to me, like, I don't know how you feel. I just want to kind of finish with this. But if someone's like, hey, what can I do to, like, be, be like, more healthy? Like, physical. What's a physical behavior? Like, what should I be doing in the gym? And, I, and I'll say, you shouldn't be doing anything in the gym. But if you want one simple thing that will add the biggest return, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know you, but I, I would like to get to know you because I might have a different answer if, if we actually had a relationship. But if I didn't know you at all, I'd say, and if you're not walking regularly, I, I would say like, like walking should be, you know, a pretty regular thing. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. W w walking is big and I'm happy to uh, let that be the, be the end of this conversation. Awesome. I, speaking stuff, of, I, I'm going to go swimming actually, but yeah. I love it. Total pleasure. Uh, I will see you next week and hopefully we can get some questions from viewers um totally. i know this is kind of early in our channel but i'm excited because it's getting some views and people are starting to tune in so i want this to uh really be a bigger conversation and a bigger community i think next week we're, we're going to try to have some uh some guests on the show that's that's uh my intention and right on uh, let's do it yeah I'm, I'm i'm loving this awesome take care man a pleasure awesome see you liam